Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Likeable Science with Ethan Allen, and I'm the uh, guest host, and he's the host guest. You can switch those around whichever <laughs> way you want. And we're talking about a subject this Friday that we've talked about before a couple of occasions, which is CRISPR. And CRISPR uh, was in the paper a couple of days ago, a few days ago, uh, with a Chinese scientist who, who went public on a, on a discovery that, well, uh, um, uh, a, a biological action that he could recreate a human being using CRISPR, whoa, okay. And then immediately the, the, the hailstorm started because <laughs> there's big ethical questions in that. So tell us what happened actually. Well, again, all this is just sort of reports that we hear. Uh, not too much of it has been absolutely confirmed yet, but apparently this Chinese scientist, last name of Hei, uh, helped this woman uh, taking, took her embryos and edited two of the, one of the genes for HIV resistance, because apparently the father of these, uh, these embryos was HIV positive. And so he edited this gene to, to make, it, make the embryos more resistant to getting HIV. Well, that all sounds pretty positive. It's, yeah, uh, right. Uh, you can sort of see his motivation for doing that in that sense. Um, however, basically, CRISPR, which stands for Clustered Regularly Interspersed Short Palindromic Repeats. No, that's, that's going to be on the final exam. <laughs> I hope you caught that. <laughs> uh, it's still a very experimental technique, right? I mean, it's a, it, a CRISPR is basically it's a, a little molecular machinery they found in bacteria and archaea that they basically used to defend themselves. They would snatch little bits of, of the DNA from viruses that were attacking them and then use it to fight the viruses. Oh, interesting, like, a, yeah. like a, a vaccination almost exactly. at the DNA level. Right, they sort of pick it up, copy it, <laughs> and they combine it with something called a Cas9, which is a protein which can go in and... CAS-9. Right, which is just CRISPR-associated protein 9. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it basically can snip that stuff out, and that's, that was the basis of uh, sort of this whole technique, because this allows you to essentially snip DNA and then you can simply insert other bits where you can, snipped. Can I drill down right there? Sure. How do you snip? Your little tiny scissors? How do you snip out from the virus and put it somewhere else? How do you change you know, things that small? Well, more, more or less, I mean, it's, it's molecular scissors, if you will. They're, 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 uh, molecules have the right receptors to, to latch on to things at the right point and literally have them bond to that molecule instead of this molecule and then pull it away. And it's now snipped out. And so it's not a chemical thing; it's a physical thing. Well, I'm able to at, go at, into at, at that level. Chemistry and physics are pretty. Oh, much thank the same, you for that. that I, yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah. Uh, and the other thing is, no, okay, now you've done that. You mm -hmm. you created like one cell, maybe, or a handful of right. cells, I suppose. But but primarily one right. cell, which has different characteristics, right. and it happens to be a human cell, and it has to be uh, happens to be um, better better equipped to deal with uh, with HIV. Uh, how do you make that into a person? How do you take the one cell and do anything with it? Well, that is, they did this with uh, very early stage embryos, which are only a few cells anyhow, and so they changed the genes within those few cells, and that has changed up permanently. If these girls grow up, become women, have kids of their own, their kids will have this modified HIV receptor. A permanent change in the DNA. In, in the gene line. Not just in the one cell, but in all the cells that come off that cell. Exactly. And we have never had anything where a, a sort of human edited change in a gene has been put into a situation where it can be passed along from generation to generation. I thought we've been doing DNA changes on people. We've been, been doing stem cell uh, you know, treatments, actually, in doctors, doctors' offices. Isn't this the same thing? It, it is. Similar but different. Uh, it's the same in, in yes, they use CRISPR in, in treating cancer or whatever, but treating it, putting it into embryos, permanently altering their DNA that they will then pass it along to their offspring is a, a very different thing than just treating somebody going in after their cancer cells and getting, you know, screwing around with all their cancer cells. Yeah. God, it reminds me of the boys from Brazil with Gregory Peck. Yeah, exactly. This is thousands of Hitlers right. is what they created. Yeah, and this is what 
people are upset about this technology really is not really ready for prime time. You know? Okay, so what what is the problem? Is it imper is imperfect? It doesn't work right. Uh, or is it the ethical consideration? Well, th there's both. One, yes, it's still being worked on the CRISPR. There's actually a lot of forms of CRISPR and associated Cas proteins, uh, multiple ones that work slightly differently, have slightly different characteristics. People are still playing with these, figuring them out. You know, again, you don't know exactly so, necessarily that it's only going to cut exactly the piece you want. You believe that, but so, so you're saying that um, on the scientific side, forget the ethical for mm -hmm. a moment. Um, that we're still we're still learning how to do this exactly. But what's what's the downside? I mean, is is this uh, going to be the creature from the black lagoon or what? What 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 are we worried about here? On the on the in, in order to do science, you have to have trial and error, don't you? Uh, to some extent, yes. And uh, the, the general opinion in this <clears throat> is there should be a lot more trials done on non-human animals before running this one on people because it does have this potential to to change the germ lines of people to really alter them in ways that we do not really fully understand. And well, that could happen with an animal, too. I mean, how can you control it? You? you could have right. a creature from the Black Lagoon that's an animal, too. You know? Right, but I mean, if, if, if your mice, your line of mice gets all weird and funky, you can just sort of exterminate your mice. Make and, them go and, away. Yeah, right, and <laughs> problem gone, you know. Not so easy with a human yeah, being. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they, they start developing a second head or whatever, you know. You, you still, like, you can't really to say, let's get rid of them. You know? So, but there, there's the possibility of real tragedy here the, the, by the, developing a human being that would be, uh, you know, a sort of pathetic uh, biological a freak result. in some and sense, we'd all, yeah. we'd all suffer knowing that happened. Yeah. Right, and, um, and so this is why, I mean, the Chinese government <clears throat> has condemned this guy, the, the scientific societies have, have condemned him. Uh, people feel it's gonna, for one, this technology has tremendous potential to be used and to be used very well to, to, to take care of, cure a lot of diseases that are currently mm. intractable. Mm. And they worry that, that this the, sort of the bad press that's resulting from this is going to set the whole thing back. Either there's going to be draconian regulation against it or it's going to get a very bad name and will be associated with sort of, you know, sloppy uh, science. So or, now you're getting into the ethics. Right. What, what is the ethical mm, conversation about this sort of thing? And this isn't the first time we've had this kind of conversation right. either, but what's the conversation about CRISPR changing human DNA? Well, it, it has sort of unparalleled capacity to change the, to, to change the germline, to change the reproductive cells, basically, and therefore to make permanent alterations in the, the human genome, as it were. Um, and that's, that's sort of a scary thing. You don't want to go into that really like, ha, 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 let's just do this and see what happens, right? It could be a worst case analysis. What could happen? Uh, it, a side effect could be, for instance, that, that the offspring all develop uh, nasty, untreatable cancers when they're three or four years old, you know? And, you know, in that case, maybe it doesn't get carried very far. Maybe they uh, develop a Huntington's type disease, so it doesn't show up until they're 40 years old. Then they develop nasty cancers. And meanwhile, they've now passed it on to their kids who are then going to develop these nasty cancers when they're 40 years old, you know? And so, so uh, it's, it's, but in the, in, take the one cell, right? and then you, you have a, a one person, and then you have that person, um, you know, have offspring with other people, and then this could be a, a dominant trait, right? you know, in the, in, the, in the way it works, and then all of a sudden, lots of people logarithmically expanding, and maybe it could cover all of humanity over time if you... You yeah, know, this, this, now you're getting into I'm sort of giving you the worst case. Gene drivers, yeah, which is a sort of related, but a sort of different kind of thing. So just yeah. as easy as making a person resistant to HIV, you can make them into a, a guaranteed psychopath. And, well, uh, well, like the quite. boys from Brazil, right? <laughs> <laughs> not quite. I mean, this was, was a, a, a no, somewhat controlled thing. And, and you know, the, uh, the genes that control our psychological well-being are, are not well understood or not that cleanly identified yet. So, so it's because we... We don't know what will happen that gives us the ethical concern about this. That's, that's in large part right. There's, there's still a lot of unknowns about it. Okay, so just um, for a moment, can we look back at ethics and science? Sure. You were telling me before the show about a conference that happened some decades ago relating to that that right. actually had a positive effect on controlling um, science that could get out of control. Right. So if you remember back in the early 1970s, the recombinant DNA became a big thing. And they were just learning how to like, start pulling genes out of one organism and sticking them into another organism in a pretty crude way. And 
that was really frightening because you all suddenly thought, yeah, what happens if I start sticking human genes into tomatoes or vice versa, you know, and you have these weird hybrid organisms. And they called a conference in Asilomar, California, and it was actually a different conference because it didn't just involve the scientists. It involved legal scholars, theologians, ethicists, uh, all kinds of different people from very different walks of life as well as the scientists who were doing the work. And they basically incorporated everyone's feedback, listened to all their concerns, and came up with a sort of a, a set of guidelines on how to deal with this. And again, they recognized then, as we should recognize now, the technology, you know, once you've let a technology out of the bottle, like the genie out of the bottle, you, you can't stuff it back in. There's just no way it's gonna go back in. It's, it's out there, particularly something like CRISPR now. CRISPR is very easy to do. It's a cookbook technology now, basically. So you don't really even have to be much of a scientist to use it if you get the right stuff. Um, you have to practice your technique, but. Um, anyhow, so what Asilomar showed us was that yes, you can bring, if you bring the right groups together, and that's more than just the scientists. Scientists have good insights, but sometimes don't see the whole picture. They they, they, yeah, they don't see the big picture. They're right. limited into science. That's the nature of right. what they do. Right, and so one hopes that sometime this may be a wake up call that we'll, we'll do the same kind of thing again and, and bring, convene a group or multiple groups around the world to think about and try to set up guidelines for how we deal with CRISPR. You know? what, what were the guidelines back when? They were basically, uh, they agreed sort of not to do certain kinds of things, that they wouldn't do this recombinant technology on people. <laughs> and you know, you just simply would not do it on people. You wouldn't try to make people with, with recombinant. Uh, they, what is recombinant technology? Well, that was, again, it was crudely sort of pulling out genes from one organism and sticking them in another organism. Okay. And, you know, they basically sort of said, it, you know, yeah, you can play around with their plants all you want, and, and, this. and they even actually put strong limits on that. And they sort of said, you know, you've got to report what you do very clearly. It should all come to some central repository. Uh, people should have a chance to weigh in on it before you proceed too far along with it. Uh, we should have an open discussion if you're, if you're doing something, say, messing around with corn plants or wheat plants or rice plants. That has potential to spread around the world. Oh, right? So we're talking about more than just ordinary human being people. Right, yeah. We're yeah. talking about agriculture in general. Right, and so they, they agreed back then, you know, these kind of issues had to be dealt with up front, and you can't just sort of let people run amok and do this. So how do you so, stop them? Well, yeah, that was, Asilomar <coughs> really, re, the results were basically a sort of self-regulation by the industry, by the enterprise. Recombinant DNA technology was pretty complicated at that point, and you couldn't just do it willy-nilly. You, know, you had to be a pretty sophisticated scientist to do it, so the community who could do it was relatively constrained. So that self-regulation sort of worked. They, Did we? they, oh, they basically all, all sort of said, yeah, we, we agree, this is very sensible stuff. You know? Okay, but you know, here we are, how many years later, right, decades 50, later, yeah. and a couple of things have happened. One is I'm sure it's easier to do uh, that technology, mm -hmm. and two is it's easier to, you know, uh, propagate that technology to everywhere in the world because right. they're a PhD in, in biochemistry and what have you um, that live in every country that are trained right. many of them in the US and yeah. and it's so easy to to be acquainted with and implement that technology now and read about it and learn about it wherever right. you are Oh, CRISPR is commercialized I mean they sell kits many multiple companies sell CRISPR Cas9 kits uh, and just you know you can just buy them anywhere you know to, to and start doing your experiments yourself. Uh, and talking so, yeah. about out of the bottle, boy. Yeah, talking about out of the bottle, right. And so uh, it may require, uh, and some uh, groups are suggesting, yes, that we should certainly have at least a national conversation, if not a global conversation, or a series of national conversations, international conversations about this, and think very hard about what, what we want the technology to do, what we really don't want it to do, and how we can sort of maximize its chance of being, of being used for good and minimize its chance for being used for ill. And whether that involves a legal system, in Britain they did that. They looked at some of this uh, technology when people began being able to move mitochondria from one cell to another. And they made strict laws about it that actually allowed in Britain the, the classic, the three-person, three-parent baby now, right, who has sperm from a don donor, the egg from the mom, and mitochondria from another woman because mom's mitochondria were sort of screwed up. Uh, and mm. we, don't, we don't actually allow that in the U.S. It was yeah. actually uh, set yeah. up by a legal process in, in Britain. They, that, that okay. Became, okay. Well, when, we, when we come back after this break, Ethan, I'm going to talk about sanctions. Okay. 
Okay. That is, um, you know, the, the, the hard end of those laws yeah. and what they mean and how well they would work, are working, um, and how they might affect us going forward. Sure. Pretty scary. Okay, take, take a minute off, everybody. Uh, Deep breath. <laughs> deal with your fears. <laughs> Come back in one minute, and we'll go further with this discussion on CRISPR and people. Aloha. I'm Marcia Joyner, inviting you to come visit with us on Cannabis Chronicles, a 10,000 year odyssey, where we explore and examine the plant that the muse has given us. And stay with us as we explore all of the facets of this planet on Wednesdays at noon. Please join us. Aloha. Aloha, my name is Mark Shklov. I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea. Law Across the Sea is on Think Tech Hawaii every other Monday at 11 a.m. Please join me where my guests talk about law topics and ideas and music and Hawaiiana all across the sea from Hawaii and back again. Aloha. I'm Jay Fidel of Think Tech here on Likeable Science with its uh, principal host, Ethan Allen, who is a scientist. He's our chief scientist <laughs> Thanks, <Jay. laughs> here at Think Tech. <clears throat> and uh, we're talking about CRISPR and how uh, it has affected and could affect the development of human people. Um, this is really kind of scary. I hope you're over the primary fear uh, in the first part of our show, because now we're going to discuss other things. So, you know, <clears throat> one thing is, uh, uh, gee, uh, how, how, do you, um, uh, how, do you, how do you deal with this in the scientific community? Uh, so you have, you have statutes, uh, they're different in different countries. Mm -hmm. uh, they may be different in different states. Who knows? You know, mm -hmm. this is really not settled. Right. And furthermore, you have sanctions. You know, every it makes it a crime, I guess. It outlaws it somehow. And then what is the sanction? You know, you go to jail. What happens? You pay a fine. What happens? The stakes are so high on this. The risks are so high um, that, you know, it's not clear that a given sanction will actually work. And, and furthermore, it's really hard to find what somebody's doing in the back end of his laboratory. Exactly. So how, is, how does it work now? How is it going to work in the future? So right now, I mean, there aren't really rules, regulations, guidelines beyond some very basic stuff that's set up. Uh, nobody sat down 10 or 15 years ago when CRISPR first was being developed and said, oh my God, let's, let's set up a, a set of policies on how to deal with this. No, no, that never happened. So there aren't any real regulations. The, the Chinese Minister for Science and Technology wrote a rather scathing, had a rather scathing statement about Hay's work. And basically, I'm guessing the, the Chinese government will impose some sanctions yeah. on him as they see fit. We have to talk about uh, the Chinese scientists involved in the, in the Chinese government's reaction. But I just, I'm just very curious as to um, how you know, how this would work in a sort of industrial sense. So I come to you and I say, you know, my family, uh, you know, we have a, a, a predilection to uh, uh, a weakness, vulnerability to HIV or any mm -hmm. number of other diseases, mm -hmm. Ethan. We'd like you to go in the back room of your laboratory and create a new, a new Fidel, okay, <laughs> that is resistant to these bad things because uh, we, we don't want our children to, you know, be dying at an early age or you know, have a bad life. So we want, we want you to make a, a super Fidel. So, okay? And we're going to give you for this, because we have the bucks, we're going to give you $100 million, Ethan. Mm -hmm. okay? You're going to be worried about the statute and the <laughs> sanctions? You're going to be worried about being turned out ethically? Well, I mean, scientists do care uh, about the, uh, the approval or disapproval of their colleagues, certainly. But it's funny you, you mentioned that. In, at Harvard right now, they are proceeding with experiments using CRISPR on sperm. It turns out, for instance, that uh, Alzheimer's, which is a devastating, ugly disease to get, right, particularly when it strikes early, and there is a particular genetic variant, uh, a, a gene called ApoE, which if you have a particular form of this gene, you have massively increased odds on developing Alzheimer's early. Mm. So 
Harvard scientists are now working on designing sperm and going into sperm and altering this APOE gene. And really all it takes, it's interesting, it's a little, literally one little base molecule out and substitute another base molecule in, and it turns it from a variant that promotes Alzheimer's to a variant that almost certainly prevents it. And so it's, and they're working on this. So uh, to make a better line of people, basically. And nobody's really come down on Harvard about doing this because they're only doing it on sperm. And there's really no the, difference. The, is the, there? Sperm per se no are never going to do anything, right? It's the same thing, but, isn't it? But, <laughs> but yes, you, you can see with in vitro technology, of course, those sperm could. And, but again, I suspect the Harvard researchers are not going to go in and sell those sperm to a sperm bank and you know, let, let them be used. That, that, that would probably cause a good deal of controversy and besmirch Harvard's fine name, right? Yeah, but it's not limited to Harvard. Right. I mean, for one thing, I want to say that until you think about sperm, um, uh, in vitro uh, fertilization, uh, when IVF, right, right. Was, was invented right here, right here in Hawaii, yeah. 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 At University of Hawaii Manoa by a guy named Ryozu uh, Yanagimachi. Uh -huh. um, we covered that years ago, uh -huh. and um, when he was active in many and genetic, genetic change kinds of experiments, and he had a lot of interesting outcomes. He was world famous, and one of the things he did, for which he was never compensated, for which the university was never compensated, for which Hawaii was never compensated, is he developed uh, IVF, huh. which is used all over the world, right. yeah. all over the world. Yeah. So my question to you, and you know, recently, um, we, uh, what is it, the uh, Vika uh, virus see, um, yeah. um, has been resolved. I think it's here. There have been, uh, yeah, you know, we're going to have a show about that not, not too far. Hawaii Biotech has been working on it. So, um, you know, I, I, think, I think there's uh, the possibility, and we have brilliant researchers, you know, at the mm -hmm. medical school, cancer research centers, yeah. crossover, you know, for this, you know, uh, molecular uh, biology. Um, is it possible that Hawaii could participate in CRISPR? Is it are we participating in CRISPR? I'm sure there are researchers here in Hawaii doing that. I, I don't know the details on that. I've not, not sort of followed who's doing what now. Uh, but the, the technology is around and available. I, I'd, be, I'd be absolutely blown away if, if it, no one was doing it here. Uh, they, they should certainly be part of it. I mean, it, it, it is. It's a technology of tremendous potential. Um, because it's a, little, it's a little easier in some sense to say we're going to edit your genes than we're going to actually sort of pull genes from a different organism and stick them into you, you know? That's, that seems mm, a heavier, a heavier shift, right? Yes. Rather than just saying, hey, we're gonna go in and fix this gene and, and make it slightly different, because your genes have these, all these variants by themselves anyhow, so yeah. all we're doing is sort of mimicking nature in that sense. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but it's, uh, you know, it, it, it is a process you don't wanna play with lightly. And, yeah. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I, I'd like to just throw the two possibilities out at you. Mm -hmm. Number one is this isn't limited to Harvard. Right. There are a lot of schools in this country, medical sure. schools and research facilities of one kind or another, um, you know, that have access to the uh, oh, yeah. uh, to the uh, uh, the same technology, mm -hmm. uh, the CRISPR technology, and likewise, there are schools all over the world. Uh, say China, right. that have access to this, and, and, and scientists that are interested in, in making a name for themselves, but also helping, exactly. uh, you know, the human race. Right. So the, the likelihood is that it's not, the genie is not going to stay at Harvard oh. or at the school the guy was working no. at in China. No, no. It's going to be hither and yon. Right. Okay, the other thing is, uh, you know, that this technology is not, it's not static. Right. It's going to change. Oh, yeah. And a third thing is that the ethics are not static either. <laughs> <laughs> because when the technology goes forward, the ethics will have to follow, don't you think? <laughs> to, to some extent, yes. And, and everyone sort of agrees it's, it would be okay to use it to fight diseases, to help cure people of incurable conditions and all that. The question becomes, suppose, hey, you know, I want to have a kid with blue eyes instead of brown eyes. You know, is, is that an okay use of it? I want my kid to be uh, six feet two instead of 5'11". You know, is, is that okay? You know, are you allowed to sort of engineer for desired traits? Yeah, uh, if I can afford it, if I can <laughs> afford it, and then the price is an issue right. going forward, if, assuming this is, you know, passes the ethical test at some point, uh, then I can create, I hate to use this term, but a master race. Mm -hmm. I can create, if I have the money, I can create a master race of people who have advantages over everyone else. Right. Super smart, super strong, super yep. resistant to disease, you yep. name it. That, that's... 
And this is exactly why this is today or yesterday or 10 years ago is the time that we should be talking about this and figuring out how to best regulate this technology, how, how to keep everything open and transparent, be sure that as, as it moves along and advances that, that we're all aware of what's being done, that people have a chance to question it before it gets too widespread, where some gene variant spreads across the world. Yeah. Uh, we, we don't want to do that. Uh, yeah, it's, it's like yeah. climate change in a sense, because you have to have a global collaboration to deal with this. And, and you have to have a global body that has some authority, and you have to have rules and statutes uh, embodying ethical concepts that, that are going to be accepted around the world and sanctions that will work around right. the world. And that's, that's very tricky because different cultures have very different views about, for instance, the sort of abnormal people. And, and some cultures have a great deal of sympathy for these people and, and embrace them. Other cultures basically shun them, think of them as, as less than fully human. And how are those cultures going to get together and come up with a, a common set of guidelines? Yeah. You know, it's going to be a very tricky thing to do. Yeah, so this guy, let me, I got to hey. read his name, this one who did this, Hei hey Jiankui, Hei right. hey Jiankui, Chinese scientist. Right. Uh, he did this, and he thought it was a good thing, and he went public with it. And then China's vice minister for science and technology, Xu Nanping, made a statement only a few days ago uh, in, in, uh, to uh, criticize him. You want to give that as the quote of the day? This is the quote of the day right. on what that scientist had done. <laughs> right. So the, the, the Chinese minister said, the genetically edited infant incident reported by the media blatantly violated China's relevant laws and regulations. It has also violated the ethical bottom line that the academic community adheres to. It is shocking and unacceptable. I wouldn't want to be that scientist right now. <laughs> because this is telegraphing, you know, terrible things that are going to happen to him. Yeah, in terms of prosecution by the Chinese government. Right, right. They're not going to tolerate yeah. this for, for world opinion purposes. Right. You know? he, he, was, he was in Hong Kong for his, for, to, where he delivered this news. And I, I would, would, if I were him, I would be on a fast boat out of Hong Kong. Stay in Hong Kong. <laughs> Get out of there. Right. Well, so the, the question is whether there'll be other uh, scientists who are, are drawn ma magnet style, you know, to this kind of technology. This, this was a comment on one of the articles I was reading was, was Hay may have been the first scientist to create uh, CRISPR babies, but he certainly won't be the last. And, wow. and you can just you can bet your bottom dollar on that. I mean, it's oh, just sure. the, the technology is just so readily available now, and there's so many people who could use it. And the potential for making a name for yourself, for making money, for doing something dramatically good, is so tremendous yeah. that yeah, other people are bound to. Ethics are going to have to change. Yeah, I suspect this is just the first of what are going to be a whole series of incidents that are going to pop up here and there and, until some sort of firestorm emerges where we really start building the regulations yeah. that we need. What I hear you saying, though, is that it's, it's not just this one guy right now. Right. There are others right now, as we sit, as we speak, oh. who are doing the same thing. And they're faced with the issue of getting criticized or prosecuted mm -hmm. the way He Jing Pu, right. Jian Kui, uh, is going to be punished uh, when they get them. Right. Um, but, you know, in different countries, different results. Right. And so uh, there are probably a lot of people who are actually who are working on it. And I know this sounds strange, but reading about this, learning about this, mm -hmm. they may be attracted to work on it now. Sure. Absolutely. And there may be people who now realize, like, I, I'd like to work on it. I better go quiet, go underground, find some rich sponsor who wants me to improve his germline, her germline, basically. You know, so they can have, yes, you know, so they can be the founders of a master race or whatever, and they'll support me while, you know, while I work out the, the bugs out of the technique, you know. And you just do it quietly and, and figure these people will, you know, the payoff will come down the road. You'll be famous, you know, 20 years from now, you know. So, yeah, I, I think it's almost inevitable at this point that, that people are going to be doing what he did in various places. But that's one of the concerns is that his actions, in some sense, have will drive some of this work underground and make it harder to see. And part of the issue and part of the beauty of Islamar was it, it, it produced transparency and everyone became very open about what, what they were doing. That was part of the deal was, hey, we all, we all want to share this. We all want to know what's going on. And, uh, yeah. Stakes are higher now, though, somehow. Yeah. Um, way higher. And I want to offer one other really interesting thought and possibility here at the end of our show, and that is, uh, I can make my, my line stronger, taller, smarter, more resistant to disease, and ready. Are you ready? With the ability 
to live longer. Mm -hmm. It's the fountain of youth. Oh, potentially, yeah. And for, for money, yeah. I can buy CRISPR technology to yeah. make my line live longer. Yes, indeed, yeah. Wow. No, no reason, no reason. There are people working on it today. I, I would bet my bottom dollar there are people working on just that problem. Wow. <laughs> Well, as usual, Ethan, we've opened up a can of worms. <laughs> and they're not going to go back in that can. <laughs> Thank you so much for this discussion. I enjoyed it, Jay. Always fun. Aloha.